Welcome back to Talking of Books. And this is what we've been waiting for. For the whole of the show, we are joined live on the air from London by Geoffrey Archer. Good morning, Geoffrey. Good morning, Isabel. How are you? I'm very good. And always, it's such a delight to have you on Talking of Books. So thank you so much for uh, giving up some time on a Saturday. Um, uh, uh, We have reviewed every single one of the Clifton Chronicles. And for most of them, you have most kindly agreed uh, to an interview at some some stage in its um in its uh, its whole span of life but did you uh, the clifton chronicles spans nearly the whole of the 20th century did you originally plan for it to be seven volumes no i had originally thought that it would be five the problem was it was at the end of the fifth harry was uh, 42 giles was 42 emma was 40 and I either had to put the three of them in a car and kill them all in one go, <laughs> or go back to my publisher and say, actually, I don't think 42 is a good age to kill them. <laughs> uh, it'll take a couple more books. So, in fact, it did take a couple more books because uh, the, the one that's out at the moment, come at the hour, is the sixth. And the final one, This Was a Man, comes out on November the 3rd this year. And that is the end of the Clifton Chronicles. Gosh, it's been, it's just been, as a reader, the most wonderful, wonderful journey. And uh, one of my favourite all-time villains, of course, is Lady Virginia Fenwick. Oh, she's wonderful. She's wonderful, Isabel. Uh, and I know exactly why you love her. <laughs> it's because you, you, because you love running things. You love organising things. <laughs> you love being in charge. And you're as bossy as Margaret Thatcher. And so when you see Virginia, you say, oh, I'd like to take her on. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, I've been I've been exposed on on radio, but, but on I am radio. bossy. I am I am bossy, um, and I just love. Well, Margaret the... Thatcher used to say it was a bad word. She said, "Why do you describe?" She said to me once, "Why do you describe men as leaders and women as bossy?" And of course, she's right. It's it. You should, in fact, the word should be leadership. Okay, well, that's that's really nice. But did you imagine? I, I doubt whether you did, if, uh, um, that she would be around in the sixth book. Now, it's a very good question. I'll tell you why, because I was going to kill her off in book two. I had whole plans to get rid of her, and then the fans started writing in, and their attitude was the same as yours. Mm-hmm. Can't wait to find out what happens to Virginia next. And I can tell you, in the final book, she's even more evil. Oh, great, great. Um, because um, in, in the, final, the final two cliffhangers of this book, one involves Virginia and the second um, involves something else. Now, on that note, will Giles find happiness? What do you think? Or is that something that... Wait we mean, what do wait? I think? I already know you. Well, <laughs> <I'm>... <laughs> should he? It and handed it in. Okay, should he it's find what you happiness? Think, not what I well, I, I I don't think he will. That's my honest opinion. Uh, so so I'll have to wait and read it. I just don't think he will. He's he's been uh, searching, searching for happiness. In my view, no. In my in my view, no. But on <laughs> on the point of of of, of Giles Barrington, um, how would he have responded to yesterday's news about Great Britain exiting the EU? Uh, he'd have been, he'd have been uh, a Remain. He'd a firm Labour supporter and uh, uh, and uh, an international figure, having been Foreign Secretary. He'd have unquestionably been a Remain candidate uh, or a Remain supporter, unquestionably. Jeffrey, can I? Uh, this is Manisha. Can I ask a question? You write with great detail and authenticity about financial impact of events, etc. Do you foresee a story in Brexit sometime in the future? Oh, sorry, what was the last sentence? Sorry. Do you foresee a new story in Brexit sometime no, in the near I future? Do not. No, no, it's been covered too well. Every single paper has it on every single page. If I was to bring out a book in 18 months' time on Brexit, they'd be bored by then. They'd say, oh, well, no, no, you've got to be original. You've got to do something that they, people haven't thought of before. You can bring in politics, but it must be a sprinkling. It, it mustn't dominate the whole thing. And in any case, the country's very divided, you know. It'd be quite hard to write a book that would appeal to everybody. 50-50. But no, is the answer to your question. No, no, no. 
Um, in Jeffrey... case you didn't understand the word no. <laughs> I think we've got that. We're all carrying in the studio. Jeffrey, this is Yvette now. Um, thank you so much for, for summing up Isabel's characteristics as well. I suspect a lot of team members at the moment will be um, not quite sure how to face her tomorrow morning in the office. <laughs> right, right. Um, one question from me. Which period did you actually... Well, two, two-part question. Which did you enjoy writing about most? Which, which of the historical periods? And which was it easiest to write about? I love this one because the 70s for me is, is when I first became aware of what was going on in, in the wider world. So it all had great meaning. But, but for you, did you have a favourite time or an easiest time for writing? I think also the 70s because that's when I was in politics working for mm-hmm. Margaret Thatcher and the opportunity to bring her into the book as a peripheral character was interesting for me with the historic connotations that went along with that. Uh, but I have to confess, I ha- and, and of course you'd say that, wouldn't you, but you're welcome to say it next year. Mm. I think the last book is the best thing I've ever done. And it may be that I was building up to the ending and have been building up to the ending for some time, but 11 people have read it so far and the the overall overarching comment again and again is I wept the, oh, I wept no, at the no. ending oh, oh, oh no, no, no. <laughs> so we, we've now got an even more bigger hanging on cliffhanger yes. for November yes I, I, yeah. I thought Cometh the Hour was the best of the Clifton Chronicles. I really, really, um, I abandoned any hope of doing anything. Once I started, I had to just read with um, a few cups of tea in between. I just could not stop. And I, 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 I loved, I loved the bit in India. I absolutely, we, we disagree <laughs> in the studio on that, but, <laughs> but it was, you know, it was um, exactly, um, we, we went to Jaipur, the three of us in the studio today went to the Jaipur Literary Festival. And it took, it, I was reading it after that, and it was like being back in Jaipur again, particularly the motorcycle bits and so on. Oh, it well, was, I love India. I have a great passion for India. I go there regularly. And actually, they're my biggest readership in the world. Uh, they're not my biggest income in the world because they don't all pay for their books. <laughs> but they're certainly my biggest readership. <laughs> Manisha's looking slightly guilty here. Slightly guilty, I feel I have to say. Um, Is she a pirate? <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. No, she's a banker, so she does everything according yes, to the book. she's a pirate. <laughs> I think that's the alternate definition for most bankers. <laughs> On that note, I have to ask you one question because my husband said I have to because there's something that he wanted to ask you when he saw you at the festival two years ago but didn't get mm. around to doing. Um, and this is verbatim. You're a gifted storyteller. Have you never wanted to use the medium of films to tell a story? You know, as in script and direct and, you know, an entire story. Mm. No, uh, although you're quite right, a director, I mean, Steven Spielberg, frankly, is a storyteller. He's mm-hmm. called a director. I'm called a novelist. I'm not. I'm a storyteller. Uh, it's a strange gift. He does it with cameras. I like to try and do it with, with words. So the answer to your question is no, I've never wanted to branch out, but it breaks my heart that uh, when I watch second-rate television shows regularly each week, uh, films and miniseries, and, and we, we still haven't sold the Clifton Chronicles to a major outlet. Uh, I would guess that 50% of the letters I receive every day say, when will this be a television series? And I have to write and say, the BBC and ITV both turned it down. Why don't you write to them and tell them how stupid they are? <laughs> yeah, and I have to say, as I was reading it, for me, it, it's, um, it's the book version of a boxed set. And I would love to see this on the TV, I have to say. Netflix. Yes, I, I'm, I'm very sad. I mean, there are people uh, showing an interest. There are major companies showing an interest. But I'd love to be on the BBC or ITV, and it's very sad. Uh, uh, there's still time, Geoffrey. There's still time. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. My grandson will no doubt not only enjoy it, but make a fortune out of it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm now wondering who to put in those characters' roles. That's, that's great. Mm. Um, well, Virginia yes, is the key. Absolutely. Because... If you have a beautiful woman who is that evil, uh, she will become a national figure. If she's, you know, it, it will make an actress into a national figure, and she'll be regularly in the press because they'll be looking at the other side of her life, her real life. So I've always worked out if it got made. Of course, Emma, Harry, and Giles—wonderful parts to play. 
but it'll be Virginia who steals the whole damn thing. Definitely. Do you have some deep mind for I was her? just going to ask you, who do you well, have? Well, uh, this is a cruel thing to say about the lady, because she's a very distinguished dame, and, but uh, 20 years ago, Christina thought Thomas would have been ideal, mm-hmm. because she had that icy, cold mm, yeah. uh, beauty, uh, which was quite frightening. You wouldn't, uh, you, she had you on edge. So I think I'm, I'm looking for a 30-year-old Christina Scott Thomas. <laughs> She'll be there somewhere. She, she oh, yes. Oh, we have the finest actresses on earth in this, in this, in this country. They dominate. I've, uh, I go to theatre once, sometimes twice a week, and I've no doubt that uh, she's out there, and there's probably half a dozen of them out there. It's just which one of them gets it. Exactly. Um, Jeffrey, um, you are, I'm sure, with, with sales of more than probably three million books worldwide, the world's most famous... I think a little more than three million books worldwide, <laughs> uh, okay. uh, Isabel. Actually, C- Cain and Abel alone have sold 37 million, <gasps> 700,000. My goodness. Okay. But I take, I take the point you're making. You're just getting your decimal points wrong. in the wrong place. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. But as th- th- we're agreed, you are the world's most famous storyteller. Um, where does the inspiration you know, come I from? I think J.K. Rowling is the mo- world's most famous storyteller. The second world's uh, most famous storyteller, no. then. <laughs> Who's I'm that? I'm fighting for first place. Okay, okay, right. <laughs> <laughs> um, where does the inspiration come from? Were you born with it? Was it something that you realised early on you had this ability? I think it is a God-given gift. I always say to, when I'm giving a lecture uh, or, or talking to young people who want to write... If you're well-educated and uh, had the sort of uh, opportunity to read lots of books when you were young, there's no reason why you shouldn't be a good writer. But there's no connection between that and the God-given gift of being able to tell a story. That is something that's quite simply God-given. I can't be an opera singer. I can't be a ballet dancer. I can't be a pianist. I'm a storyteller. And the people who do those things have been given a different gift. And I've been very fortunate. I, I've, I'm thankful every single day that this simple ability to say once upon a time and then go on for 400 pages is unquestionably a gift. What you have to do with it as well, that is not enough in itself. You do then have to work very hard indeed. And every book, the one you are looking at the moment, come at the hour, 14 drafts, every one of them handwritten, a thousand hours of work on each book. I wish there was a shortcut, but there isn't. You have to work very hard indeed. But the piece of luck is the gift. Is the handwriting by choice, or is it, is it something you prefer, or do you actually need to do that to make the story flow? I think I prefer it by choice. I think I like to see the pen moving across the paper. It's also slower than machinery. Machinery moves very much more quickly, and I like the speed with which the pen moves across the paper, so the mind is going on to the next sentence. But the second part of your question is, I can turn on an electric light, but beyond that, I'm not much good with machinery. (laughs) My wife, on the other hand, who's a scientist, has always got the very latest apple or the very latest whatever she needs to do her scientific work. And, as an, and is puzzled after 50 years of marriage how I can possibly, possibly still be writing with a pen. <laughs> um, I think, I think. Um, I mean, I embrace technology, but actually writing, um, I can feel it in my fingers. It's a sort of a... Yes. Um, and I think yeah. for those, those who've started writing, you know, or anyone who's used to writing pen to paper, it's a more create. I, I do believe... Yes, it's but a, you come from a generation, Isabel, that wrote handwritten thank you letters. Yes. And you still do, because I have your letters to prove it. Oh. And that generation may have gone. It, it, I think you're right. I think... Now, I've got a question here. Cometh the hour, cometh the man, was something that Cliff Gladwin, the Derbyshire and England cricketer said during the first te- test match against South Africa at Durban. Was that where Cometh the Hour came from? I know it's been Certainly used... Certainly by... not, not some second-rate cricketer. OK. Good okay. heavens, <laughs> no. A Derbyshire man? Not a chance. If you said a Somerset man, it would have been possible. Okay. No, no, no. OK. Cometh the Hour, the correct... I'm just looking so I don't get it wrong. Oh, didn't I put it in the book? Oh, I thought I'd put it in the front of the book, and I haven't. Uh, It is a quote, yes, from an unknown poet in about the 14th century, 14th, 15th century. 
There, there was, there was. And oh yes, I, there was an original. It certainly wasn't a Derbyshire cricketer. Yeah, I just, I just wondered. I know how much you like cricket, and I just thought, well, oh, um, I do love cricket. Yes, I do, I do, yes. I do. And and uh, we had a wonderful victory yesterday, England over Sri Lanka. They got two hundred and fifty-six, and our two opening batsmen, Roy and Hales, got all two hundred and fifty-six without being out. Fantastic, fantastic. Yeah, it was a great day. So, so, um, Jeffrey. I think, and please correct me if, if I've got this wrong, that you um, announced you were going to write the Clifton Chronicles or, or you were going to start working on it on your 70th birthday. Correct. And I was very frightened of, I guess, I was very frightened of, we all are, aren't we, of growing old. I wanted to keep the brain really moving. I wanted the energy to be there. I wanted to have something to get me up every single morning. And yes, you're right. On my 70th birthday, I declared uh, that I would be writing the Clifton Chronicles and any idea where I was going, of course, or what I was doing. I knew it was a family in Bristol and that the, my hero would be born in 1920 in the back streets and his father would work on the docks and his mother would be a very remarkable woman. I didn't know any more than that. That's about all I had. And off I went. And we're now the seventh book has been handed in. It's, it's finished. just incredible. And um, what next, Jeffrey? Because I know I've there will a be a what short next. Stories because the fans have been grumbling for five years about no short stories, and I've collected uh, twelve short stories, and they will come out about nine months later. And then I'm it's wh I'm about to set myself, I think, the toughest task I've ever had in my life, and you will get a clue to what that task is if you read the final book. Right. Oh. Mm. Oh, oh that'll mm. fool you. Yeah. That's another that'll cliffhanger. Throw you. <laughs> yes, yes. Oh, well, I really look forward to that. Roll um, in November. Exactly. Jeffrey, you November, you're... when Virginia will be more wicked than ever. Can't wait. Ah. Can't wait. Our, our favourite villain. Um, Jeffrey, it is always such a pleasure to talk to you and hear from, from, from the storytelling master. In Arabic, you would be called a Hakawati. You know the um, Irish word because I can remember you saying that on the radio. They, shanaki. A shanaki. Okay, so yeah. if, uh, as a shanaki, as a hakawati, um, you have... Hakawaki. Hakawati. Hakawati. Yes, yeah, so like that, that. that is um, the... Uh, you know, obviously within the Arab world, they are grand storytellers. It's in the blood. And, um, mm. Um, mm. and I, I would say India is the Especially same. Especially their bankers. As well, as well, as well. <laughs> um, do have a wonderful weekend in London and thank you so much for being with us on Talking of Books today and we are counting down the days oh, until the kind. 3rd of November and uh, here is a man, or here was a man. Sorry. This was, was, this was a sorry, man. This was a man. I haven't got my notes. I'm sorry. Um, all the best from us and uh, look forward to... Where does to this was a man come from, Isabel? This was a man. I don't know. Tell us, please. It's Shakespeare. Shakespeare. Which now one? Now you all have to look it up. Okay, which one? No, I'm not giving you lots of things. <laughs> I give you a little clue, and then you get on with it. All right, don't sit all there right. expecting me to do everything for you. Get on with it. <laughs> on that happy note, You'll I will. You'll have a hundred people ringing in in the next few minutes telling you exactly which play it comes from. <laughs> I was thought I could um, circumvent that. This was that. the noblest Roman of them all. Julius all Caesar. All the conspirators <laughs> save only he did what they did in envy of great Caesar. He only, in a common thought, made one of them. His life was gentle, and the elements so mixed in him that nature might stand up and say to all the world, this was a man. Oh, thank you. Thank you for that, and thank you for reciting that so beautifully. Um, all the best from myself, from Manisha and Yvette, from Talking of Books. It's been a pleasure. Thank you so much, Geoffrey. Thank you very much, Isabel. Take care. Speak soon. Bye-bye. Thank, Bye -bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs>